Huh? Yeah? All right, cool. Um, thank you guys for coming out today. I appreciate it. Um, I'm from Chicago. I don't know if that was mentioned. Um, I don't know how Carrie Ann managed to get me here with the YPS program, but she did it. Um, I'm the youngest of four children, just a little background information. Um, I became a Christian my freshman year of high school, and since then, life got messy. Um, but I don't want to talk about that today. If you talked to me two years ago, I'd stand up here and tell you a testimony of pain and struggle in life. But today, that's not the testimony I'm going to tell you. I'm going to share a journey of traveling on the way of faith. Since I've become a Christian, I've been to Mexico four times on mission trips to the Guatemala border area. Um, I've been to Ethiopia once during my senior year of high school. I went on a solo trip during our winter break and uh, worked in an orphanage and uh, held sports camps for kids infected and affected by HIV. Um, and then there's last year, um, where everybody thought I was a little crazy, and during my junior year decided it's time to take a study abroad, leave Westminster, go to Costa Rica, and then continue that by taking a semester off and traveling through Latin America, starting in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and moving my way south, west, north, east. <laughs> um, and you can see the map I had before. Actually, that map is one that I took with me my whole trip. Um, so it's got some significance for me. I have been to 14 countries, which uh, actually isn't that many, I guess, but I think I probably have a lot of you guys beat, maybe not. Um, but what I've noticed on the road is that you can identify clearly the difference between a tourist and a traveler. The tourists are there for escape, they're there for a highlight adventure, for entertainment, they come with a lot of money and a little bit of time. But your traveler, your traveler is there for fulfillment. They're there to exchange culture and resource. They're there for education. And they're there for relationship. I think her name's Belloc. I had this journal a friend gave me before I went on my trip. It's up here as well. And in there, it was a daily journal that had a verse and it had a, like a quote that went with it every day. And in that journal, I found this quote. It said, I have wandered all my life, and I've traveled. The difference between the two is this. We wander for distraction, but we travel for fulfillment. My trip allowed me to evaluate on a different level. I spent my time not going as a missionary to another country, which I had in the past, but I went trying to see what it's like to have a reflex of mission in my life, to be able to be willing to serve on the fly, I spent my time reading through the Bible, watching people pass by, building relationships. But I spent time evaluating my faith. And I learned that there are two ways of faith as well. There are the travelers and there are the tourists of faith. For those of you who are involved in FCA, you might know that a little bit better as the fan and the follower. The tourist of faith is perhaps a believer they're maybe unwilling to adapt fully to the lifestyle that Christ has called them to live. <clears throat> they occasionally involve themselves in prayer. That they're lukewarm, perhaps. There are high moments that they engage themselves in, but when the low ones come, they perhaps find themselves running. This book is quite destroyed, um, at least the binding and the cover. I don't know what you call this plastic stuff, um, but it's messed up. I've read this book, I don't know how many times, uh, four, five, six, seven times <laughs> during my journey in faith. And uh, Peterson, it's written by Peterson, the guy who translated the message. It's called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. I have a little bit I want to read from you from this because um, what Peterson does is he works through some of the Psalms and he identifies the difference between a traveler and a tourist um, as well. He says, religion in our time has been captured by the tourist mindset. Religion is understood as a visit to an attractive site to be made when we have adequate leisure. For some, it is a weekly jaunt to church. For others, an occasional visit to special services. And then he continues later, and he says, They are impatient for results. They have adopted a lifestyle of a tourist and only want the high points. But a pastor is not a tour guide. I love Peterson. I'm just throwing that out there. And, uh, okay, so... Then the traveler, right? The traveler is active and involved in their faith. 
They have reflexes of prayer, of service, of community, and of love. They are involved in a relationship with God as well as his church. They are obedient and adaptive to God's culture. They are persistent and perseverant in God's path. And as Peterson would put it, they are on the long journey of a pilgrimage going towards God and a discipleship and apprenticeship to Jesus. Throughout travel, we see the transformation of pain in our lives to blessing. That's why you stand, I stand here not telling you a story of pain, but a story of blessing. We have become accustomed to the walk and the work of God in our lives through traveling. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Psalm 19, 7 and 8 say, The signposts of God are clear and point out the right road. The life's maps of God are right, showing the way of joy. The Bible continues with numerous examples of travel and road, the idea of journey and faith. Jesus put it as, I am the way and the truth and the life. In many ways, I'm a great traveler. Um, but what is about to follow is a personal critique and a confession revealing the tourist in me. I have an admiration for Christian radicals, people like Shane Claiborne, Rob Bell, Tony Campalo. And uh, you can see a array of some of my favorite books, perhaps. But I have failed to really allow those books to change me, as well as the Bible. In my mind, I am in great admiration. But does my daily behavior represent that? I have failed to let go of the tour guide and run in the path of Christ, the path of love. For that, I'm ashamed. I drink, I swear, I overconsume, overplan, undershare, underconsider, and most importantly and disgracefully, I have underloved and underforgiven. Jesus said, I should think it was Jesus. <laughs> The um, Bible says, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? Well, my heart's messed up. In my heart, I have both love and hate. I have thankfulness and I have envy. I have grace and I have anger. And hence, my mouth is full of both praise and swears. My hands preserve and destroy. And my soul is content as well as tormentful. I am lukewarm and noncommittal. I pack for a retreat on the path of life, but often I tend to tread an ordinary path of desire. I'm shameful to admit that I am a tourist. I live in excess while others live in little, and I justify my personal spendings by acting as if what I give is enough. I use my dollars for my desires and my change for the offering plate. I have a bajillion toothbrushes, but I only need one. I have books on my shelves. I have an iPad, a Mac, iPods, cell phones. I have a large array of music. I've got two bank accounts. And I'm ashamed, because I know somebody else doesn't have any of that. I'm 21 years old, and I have the security that some people will never see in their entire life. But I choose to do nothing with that. Forgive me. As the, I think Donna Miller would say in Blue Like Jazz, forgive me for misrepresenting Christ to you. Matthew 19, 21 says, he's talking about the rich man, right? And Jesus, the rich man comes to Jesus and he's asking him, what, you know, what can I do to receive the kingdom of God? And Jesus tells him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions, Give the money to the poor, and you will have the treasures of heaven. Then, come follow me. But when the young man heard this, the young man, let me point out, he went away very sad, for he had many possessions. I think what Jesus did more powerfully in the New Testament is show us the difference between guidelines and conscience. Often our struggles right now in the church are deciding what's right and what's wrong. But often we fail to focus on our conscience. What does our conscience tell us about what's right and wrong? 
and we fail to act in love often. My issue here may not be the same one you have, but my conscience tells me I have too much and have done too little. I have ate with people on the streets in three different countries. I can't tell you how, or three different continents. I can't tell you how many countries. I have donated many dollars, many hours, and many other resource and time to, uh, to bettering other people. But what I do in and out of my 24 hours a day, in between those retreats, I find is very little. I have a child I sponsor, and I allowed that to take the place of my offering, but that's not appropriate. I need to get back on the traveling side of faith, to follow, to follow more closely. Um, in Red Letter Revolution, um, it's up here. I just started it, but it's really good. Um, I recommend it. If you like Bob Goff when he came to speak, I think you really like Shane and Tony Campalo there. Um, they talk about the Red Letter Revolution. The red letters being the part of the text where God speaks to us, right? Those things that, and he identifies, does Jesus really actually want us to do these things? We focus so much on these black letters sometimes, but we ignore. Does Jesus really want us to sell our possessions and give them to the poor? No, no, maybe we should just love our neighbor. But maybe we're we'll called to do a little bit more, to minimize that gap and to minimize our hypocrisies. What they talk about this a little bit is that we all have hypocrisy, right? 